Hello everyone, my name is Leah Belletto and you might be used to seeing me on Newsround but today I'm hosting something a little different but very special and very exciting. Today is the publication day of the Ichabog by JK Rowling and um, we're celebrating this with a very unique event with the author herself in Edinburgh. Um, this is of course her first children's book since the Harry Potter series and it's a lovely fairy tale for younger children and uh, can be enjoyed by all of you and your families as well. Now I'm going to be asking some questions first and uh, then we'll be having some questions from some very special guests could be a busy uh, day because at the end we'll be lucky enough to have JK reading from the book to give those who haven't read it yet just a, a little taster of things to come. Uh, there's also uh, been a vote over the last week for readers to decide which chapter we're going to hear. Um, but first of all, Joe, hello and congratulations on publication day. It must be so exciting for you. It really is. Thank you very much. Very exciting. It's quite a unique journey, the Ichabog, to getting published because you wrote this, I believe, quite a while ago. I did. I had the idea for the Ichabog, I think, maybe 12, 13 years ago. It's a long time ago. And um, I, I read it aloud to my children when they were very small, my younger two children. And um, I always loved it, but when I decided I wasn't going to publish a children's book after Harry Potter next, it, it went up into the attic and, and there it stayed. And over time, I think I just felt the moment, the moment had passed somehow. But then we ended up going through a very strange moment this year and, and so the Ichabog resurfaced. And uh, you decided from the beginning that the proceeds of this book would go to those charities that can help people affected by the coronavirus. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, um, yes, that's, that's correct. What's going to happen is that the royalties from the published books are going to go to my charitable trust, and then they will be given um, to medical and frontline charities um, dealing with people who are affected by um, COVID-19, and that's in the UK and internationally. And then as time goes on, um, and we'll hopefully have more ro royalties to distribute, then we'll be able to to give it to those groups who are, who are most vulnerable and who, who need help at this time. That's wonderful. Now, one of the most exciting things, I think, uh, about the story is that it was obviously serialised online, um, but then your publishers decided that they they wanted to run a competition where children could illustrate parts of the book. Have you enjoyed looking at all the entries that were sent in to you? Well, that was that was actually my my idea in, in the beginning. When I when I um, got the Ichabog out of the box where it had been for such a long time, I was thinking as I read this this should be an il illustrated book, and I wanted I wanted to do something. We were on strict lockdown at the time, as you know, and I wanted mm -hmm. to do something for children to give them something that they could enjoy, but also something that they could do. And so I I had the idea that children could illustrate the book and we, we would run a competition. And uh, that competition, I think it's safe to say, went, through, went beyond my wildest imaginings. I think we had overall about 60,000 entries, which was mind blowing. And wow. um, yeah, in the end, we, we could only have 34 pictures in each of the editions of the book, which was frustrating for me because, <laughs> but at the same time, if I'd been judging, I probably, we'd probably have a, have a book sort of this big because I'd put all the pictures in. They were amazing. So, so hard. Well, you've got the finished book, haven't you, next to you. Uh -huh. And uh, yes. today you're going to be answering some questions from some of the winners, there it is, of the illustration competition, um, because this was um, a worldwide competition, um, and we'll have some of the winners joining us from not only the UK, but from Ireland, India, the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So first of all, uh, Joe, we have Ewan from Fife in Scotland. Hello, Ewan, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. Such an exciting day. Now your winning drawing is actually from chapter 54 and it illustrates a part of the story where the Ichabog explains its origin. Um, please can you hold up the book to show us the drawing? Yeah. Oh, wow. 
you've drawn a really, really powerful image there, Ewan. Um, can you tell us what it was in particular about that chapter that sort of inspired that powerful drawing? Well, the chapter was about like feelings of hatred and anger, and I thought that the volcano could really demonstrate those feelings. Yeah, like that. Yeah, that's what a volcano mm. would do for that. You've definitely achieved that. Um, I'm quite interested to know wh what you enjoyed about reading the Ichabod. What stood out for you? I quite like the story because it um, was kind of a bit of magic and mystery combined with evil and trickery. And I thought it was like great to read a new book during lockdown. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and you have a question for JK. This is your big moment. Go ahead. Uh, if you, When you found the book in your attic, what made you feel like you should publish it? Well, I think I'm married to a doctor and I, I have another doctor in my family. And I think like a, a lot of creative people, you and we, we wanted to do something to help at this time. You know, we were watching all these immensely brave key workers going out and doing all this work for all of us. And I was thinking, what can I do that's meaningful to, to help at this time? And I, I thought of, um, I particularly thought of children probably younger than you, who were stuck at home, can't see their friends, and parents trying to homeschool and, you know, keep them entertained and amused. And I thought, I thought, yeah, I've got something in the attic that might be able to help with that. So that's, that's really how it came about. But it was, it's been an amazing experience for me. Um, I read that, I read the story to my kids when they were younger and just bringing it out again and sharing it with so many young people was incredible. And, and for your age group, people who really understand the themes of the story and relate to it on perhaps a slightly deeper level, um, I found it so satisfying to hear people's ideas and interpretations. And your illustration is such a magnificent example of that. Um, I know the lines that you've, um, that you've illustrated and that, that sort of primal emotion of rage and anger and there's a line, um, the blood poured on the land like rain. And I think you've just, you've just encapsulated that with that volcanic image. So I was, I was very glad you won. Thank you. Thanks so much for that lovely question, you and, and uh, of course, the brilliant illustration too. Now we're moving across to another winner this time, and it's in India and it's Divi Man. Divi Man, are you there? Hi. Now, your illustration, it's at the end of chapter 34. It's a good one because it, it shows Mr. Dovetail with long hair, doesn't it, and a white beard. Um, can you just hold up the book and show us your picture, please? Oh, wow. Look at that. And this combines some of your passions, doesn't it, of, of drawing portraits. Tell us a little bit about your drawing. I like to do portraits with because I like to read about people and then I draw them. I like it because everyone the same things on their faces, but still everyone looks different. And I, I hear that during lockdown, it was quite important for you to draw every day. Tell us how that experience helped you during this time. I also draw in the lockdown and I draw every day. Oh, wonderful. Do you have a question? Joe? Yeah, my question to Joe is that do you have the story and characters in your mind before you write a story or you imagine them while writing the story? That is a, I love this question because the answer is it, it probably happens a different way every time for me. Sometimes the first idea is, is of the plot and you find the characters as you go. And sometimes the whole story grows out of a character. So it's, a, it's, it's an excellent question. And can I just say, I think your, your portrait of Mr. Dovetail is, is just magnificent. I really do. He looks, so, he looks kind. He looks as though he's been through real hardship, which of course he has. And uh, I, yeah, I just think you did a portrait of a very brave man. I, I loved it. In the case of the Ichabog, I, the characters really came to me fully formed. Um, I had ideas about each of them and, and they didn't really change through the, through the writing of the story. But what first came to me was the idea of the monster. So um, really the whole story came out of the Ichabog itself. 
Well, thank you very much, Stevie Man. Next, we have a question um, from the US. This is Manvik. He's joining us from California. Now, Manvik, your illustration is from chapter uh, 36, um, and this is from the USA and Canadian edition. And um, it's actually the scene from the orphanage. Um, could you just hold that up for us to have a look? Yes. Oh, wow. Now, this competition, that's brilliant. Um, was two of your favourite interests. Can you tell us a bit more about that, Mandy? Um, well, I'm a really big fan of J.K. Rowling's work, and um, I was really excited when I found the Ichabod online. Um, I really like drawing and painting, so when I found the competition, it was um, I really liked it, and it was a perfect combination for both my interests. And tell us a bit about your passion for libraries and your school library in particular. Yes. So during the pandemic, um, my library has helped me a lot and, um, and supported me by letting mm. us check out books and um, delivering it to us by curbside pickup. Um, wow. Librarian also hosts events like book signings and that's where I learned the excitement of getting a book signed. Mm -hmm. I love libraries. I spent a lot of my time right about your age in libraries too. Um, but Manvik, here is your chance now to put your question to J.K. Rowling. Go ahead. Thank you. So my question is, what inspired the names of the characters and places in the Ichabod? That's another excellent question. Let me firstly say that I am now a fan of yours. That picture is amazing, the picture of the orphanage. And it's, it's such an important location in the story, as you know. And I was, I was thrilled when I saw which picture had been chosen because I thought yours was fabulous. Anyway, what was the question? Yes, names, names in the story. So um, the names for all the cities obviously all come from the foodstuffs that they produce. So that was, that was kind of fun to create. And I liked the idea of um, calling the king Fred because what I really like, yeah, I think it really sums Fred up as a character that he just cho chooses fearless, not because he is fearless, but because it sounds good with Fred. You know, that's a very Fredish choice. But the most important name in the whole book is the name of the Ichabod itself, because that came from the word Ichabod, or the name, which is sometimes also used as a proper name. And the meaning of that word is without honour, or sometimes it's translated as the glory has departed. And so it was a play on that word because the monster is used in a way that means honour departs the, the kingdom of Cornucopia, except in a few heroic characters. So yeah, that was probably the most important name for me, but actually that came to me right at the start when I was writing the story. So the name and the, and the, and the creature came together, which I, Names are very important to me and they often do help me create the character. So, great question. Uh, but let's now head to Canada. Uh, where we've got Clara standing by in Vancouver. Hello, Clara. Clara, you uh, did an illustration from chapter 13 um, of the USA and the Canadian edition and it's of a dog tangled up in brambles. Can we have a look at that illustration, my lovely? Oh, wow. Amazing. Oh, I love that so much. It's so vivid. Can you tell us um, a little bit about the themes in the Ichabod and, and why it appealed to you the most? I like the Ichabod guys full of tears and catching the brambles. I like the Ichabod guys full of tears because I like drawing eyes and emotion in them. I like catching the brambles because dogs are really kind, faithful, and forgiving animals. Can you tell us, Clara, a bit about your drawing and what inspired you to create such a lovely drawing? My dog inspired me to do it. Yeah, I had three of them. So one of them, Rose, has very fluffy cheeks. I used her <laughs> fluffy cheeks and I used another one of my dog's ears. <laughs> that sounds brilliant. Um, Clara, would you like to now ask JK a question? Which characters do you enjoy making more, good ones or evil ones? Clara, that's such a, that is an excellent question because I think um, a lot of people, I, I'm often asked whether it's more fun to create the baddies. 
And um, it can be real fun to create someone like Spittleworth, who's so evil and so, um, so cunning. But I also, I do really enjoy creating the good characters. I think that the, the, um, the good characters in the Ichabog, they're all good in very different ways. So for example, um, Mrs. Beamish, who's one of my favorite characters, Mrs. Be Beamish, the pastry cook, she's someone who has to recognize that she's, she's believed a lot of lies. She has, to believe, she, she has to come to terms with the fact that she was wrong in believing what she believed. And she's so brave and she deals with that so courageously. And then you have someone like um, Mr. Dovetail, who from the start isn't fooled by what's going on, but who manages somehow to survive because he holds on to his love for his daughter. So um, I, I really enjoy both kinds. And can I just say, I have two dogs. I'm really envious that you've got three, but I don't think my husband will let me have another one. The two, the two of them he feels are, are enough. But um, I love your picture so much, and I, I love it even more now you've explained that your dog's inspired it. So thank you. So thank you, Clara. Next, uh, we have Ella from Australia, where I know it's really early in the morning there. So thank you so much for getting up uh, for us. Um, now, you're calling us, actually, from Kangaroo Island, where you're camping with your school. Good morning, Ella. Good morning. Now, your illustration is from chapter 24, and um, well, it looks good enough to eat. Can you show us that picture? Oh, yum, yum. Yes, I could do with a bit of those pastries. Um, Ella, I wanted to ask you why you were keen to enter the competition to start with. Um, so I was keen to enter because I have always been inspired by Joe's writing and her imagination. And it has always been one of my dreams to be a part of like her book, whether it be me writing part of it or having my illustration in it. So how do you feel? I know you're beaming away there, but how do you feel about being a winner? Um, I was so excited and I couldn't believe that I won. And I felt like I was winning a golden ticket from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And I have been thinking about winning, like the moment of winning ever since. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And I would like to thank Joe for giving everybody in the world affected by COVID-19 to have something nice to think about. Oh. Well, thank you, Ella. Um, and without further ado, would you like to ask your idol a question? Um, so when you first thought of the Ichabog, did you have an idea about what it looked like and how does that compare to the one that has been chosen? Well, Ella, let me first of all say what an honour it is to be in a book with you. I love your picture. You. And we had, we had so many amazing pictures of all the pastries and the cakes. And I, and I really, really loved yours. So I was thrilled when it was chosen. It was, it's just gorgeous. Um, so my idea of the Ichabog, I actually, in, in the dusty box I got down from the attic, I found um, a sketch that I'd done for myself of the Ichabog. And in fact, it's incredibly like the one that's, that, that's in the book. I do describe it in a lot of detail when you, when you finally meet the Ichabog in, in the story. Um, so he's sort of lovable and scary at the same time. He's scary because of his size um, and his shining eyes are a little bit creepy. But in fact, as we find out, the Ichabog isn't, isn't quite what he's been painted to be. So um, yeah, I've loved the whole experience. And, and what you've just said about, you know, giving people something nice to think about. The feeling was really mutual because as the, as the chapters were going up online every, every weekday, it really gave me something wonderful to look forward to too because I, I knew I was gonna see some more pictures and I was gonna to get to you know, speak to readers. I just loved getting the feedback from the stories and it just, it reminded me how much I love writing for your age group. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Next, uh, we're going to Ilias, who's joining us from Ireland, whose illustration is the Ichabok eating mushrooms. Hi, Ilias, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Now, your illustration is at the end of chapter, oh, it's 52, isn't it? 
and it's of the um so let's have a look hold it up oh yes loving that um now i hear you've been watching lots of but sort of videos of illustrators haven't you um, yeah, tell us more about that um well during lockdown we watched um Jack Barnett put up lots of um, books that he had written <laughs> and we watched um, Mo Willems uh, put some of his drawings up and John Classen too and I really enjoyed watching those videos and it was and then when the Ichabod came up we sort mm -hmm. of mixed the both together. And what was it about your illustration that you enjoyed the most. Tell us a bit about the creative process for you. It was the the first uh, installment that involved drawing the Ichabog. So I was just really excited about drawing the Ichabog. Well, it's it's a big hit, I'm sure. Um, yeah. What's your question to Joe Elias? My question is, is how did you the pastry that inspired your hopes of heaven? I couldn't believe this question because I, when, after you, after, when I saw that you were going to ask this question, because I, I, I had advanced warning, I suddenly thought, is that where I got the idea? Because I lived in, in Portugal for a while. And I, I love Portugal. I love the language and I love the food. And I suddenly thought, ah. Oh, was that in the back of my mind with hopes of heaven? So the honest answer is, I don't know. But imagination is a, is a peculiar beast. And it's very possible that in the back, in, somewhere in my subconscious, that idea was lurking and that, that it came out as hopes of heaven. So you reminded me of something I'd forgotten. Um, and I just need to say how much I love your Ichabog. I absolutely you. love your Ichabog. It's perfect. So thank you. We are now heading to New Zealand with uh, Sienna. And again, it's quite early in the morning, isn't it, Sienna? So thank you so much for being with us. Um, your illustration, it's right next to you there, is um, chapter 14. It's Lord Spittleworth and his candle. And it's so striking. Can you um, tell us a bit about where you got your inspiration for this? I love it. In my mind, I saw a pitch black background with a flaming candle in the middle, which lit up the villain's cruel face grinning eerily in the darkness. First, I sketched the main shapes, his head, his arm, his body and, his can and the candle. Then I added the details, like the wax running down the candlestick and the details on his face, like his sticking out nose and narrow eyes. Next, the shading. I shaded one side of his body lighter than the other of his body to show the effect of the light of the candle. Colouring the candle created the glow. First I coloured in the candle's flame. Then I coloured in the yellow, then blended it to orange, which led to red. This was an important part of the picture the colours had to be as vibrant and as striking as possible. Then I had the long trick ahead to the pitch black background. To make the glow and the dark effect, I shaded the black into the red around the outline of the flame. This also made a light flickering effect. Altogether, it took around five days until it was completed. Wow, well, it was well worth the effort. I think it's quite striking. Um, Sienna, I also hear that reading the Ichabod was one of your highlights during lockdown. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? I loved reading the Ichabod. I was practically counting the minutes between um, chapters. I was missing books from the library and I'd read every single book in the house. And <laughs> I read the chapters many, many times and also read them to my seven-year-old brother. Oh, wonderful stuff. Um, what would you like to ask Jo? How did you think of the many brilliant ideas behind the Ichabog? For example, how did you plot Lord Spittleworth's evil plan and Daisy's clever plan to stop it? Sienna, I just want to say you're 
picture is absolutely magnificent. It was one of my very, very favourites, and I was, I was so glad to see it was chosen for the, for the finished book. And I had my fingers crossed that it would be chosen, because I thought it was so wonderful. And one of the things that, that I love about it is it's so symbolic of, of this story, the surrounding darkness. And somehow you've managed to convey both how sinister Spittleworth is, but the power of even one small flame. And of course, later in the story, we see Daisy feeling as though she's got a flame she can't extinguish in herself, which is the hope that she can save the country. So that was the reason I absolutely loved your picture. Um, so you've also asked a really interesting question because I think there's such a contrast between Spittleworth's plan, which he thinks up on the spur of the moment. He suddenly sees an opportunity. He sees the, a dead man and he sees a chance, a chance to get a lot of power and money for himself. So he seizes the moment and then works from there. And his objective is all about him. But Daisy's plan is very different because Daisy has, it, it doesn't come to her in a moment. She simply got this conviction that she can make things better in Cornucopia somehow, but she doesn't know how. And her ambition isn't for herself. It really is for the whole country. And then when she meets the Ichabog, she's feeling her way all the time. She can't, unlike Spittleworth, she doesn't see the whole plan in an instant. She just has an instinct that I need to be kind. I need to make friends with this creature. I need, I need it to trust me. And then let's see what will happen from there. So she just goes step by careful step. And of course, her plan, as we know, is a little better laid than Spittleworth's, but he gets away with it for a long time, as I think you'll agree. Sienna, thank you so much for asking such a good question, and um, I hope that answers it. Thank you. Let's head back to the US, um, where Annika is standing by in Washington, DC. Um, Annika, your illustration is from chapter 10, and that's of the US and Canadian edition. And um, it actually features the ladies of the court on the palace balcony. Hello, Annika. Can you show us your illustration, please? Hello. Oh, wow. Tell us a bit about your drawing. <clears throat> Ladies of the court on the palace balcony seem to me to be a particularly colorful and beautiful scene. I imagined a festival with fireworks and a lot of pomp and show. I chose this particular theme because it was a celebration and there was a lot of excitement and anticipation in the air. It was an optimistic moment filled with hope and the possibility of peace. Oh, wonderful stuff. Um, can you tell us, I'm particularly interested in why you decided to enter the competition? During the pandemic lockdown, the Ichabog story was a very happy thing to look forward to every day. I wanted to participate in the Ichabog contest because I love books, especially all the Harry Potter books. I also love art and drawing, and the contest seemed to bring together the two things that I love most, reading and drawing. So, Annika, you've got the last question uh, for J.K. Rowling. So, I'm going to hand over to you. I love the story of the Ichabog because it was adventurous and hopeful. What is the main message you hope your readers will take away from the Ichabog? And why is this story even more important in today's world? Well, firstly, Annika, I love your picture so much. I love, you, you really did convey that sense of fireworks and celebration. And it's, a, it's an important moment in the story, as you've correctly said, because it's at a moment where cornucopia is about to go to a dark place, though it doesn't yet know it. And in that moment, to have all of that colour and celebration and pageantry at that moment is, is particularly poignant. Um, so... The themes of the Ichabog for me, and the reason that it is a hopeful story, are that people can change. People can learn and grow. And the way that the Ichabog um, 
I don't want to give too much away if anyone hasn't, hasn't read the story, but as most people have, I will say, the way that new Ichabogs are formed through the bonding is, is a symbolic... Um, is a symbolic creation of the way that we can change if we want to be better or braver. We, we don't have to remain what we are. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of a timeless message. You know, I don't think it's particular to now. As I say, I wrote this book quite a long time ago. I suppose that I, that I believe that kindness, um, mutual respect, because some of the characters, um, for example, Roderick, is quite a baddie when we first meet him. Mm -hmm. But through the kindness of his friends, he, he changes and he shows the real good that's in him. So I think that those messages are, are always important. They're just always important. And I think when we fail to live up to those things, bad things can happen, as, as happens in Cornucopia. Perhaps the most important thing that the characters in the book learn is not to believe easy lies, to to remain questioning of, of what you're told and to believe in goodness, I suppose, because da Daisy never stops believing in goodness. She could become very bitter, but um, she's really the one who saves the country and she believes in kindness. So that was, that was what I was trying to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. And thank you everyone um, who's asked a question today. And of course, congratulations uh, to all of your winning entries. This uh, really has been quite special. Now, don't switch off because there's lots more to come. Now, many of you would have been voting on which chapter you would like JK Rowling to read today. And before we reveal the winning chapter, um, I'd like to say to Jo, this has been a real honor and thank you for being with us today. So the book is out, it's publication day. And you must be so happy to finally have a book out there on the shelves. I really am. You know, I, 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 this is my 14th published book. Um, and it's, and it, it occupies a very special place in my heart because of the way it came about. Uh, this has been such a terrible year for so many people. I don't know a single person who hasn't been affected by this crisis. And um, it's, it's been a real joy just to give something and, and try and make things a, a bit easier, at least for children. So I, you know, it was a privilege. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you to everyone who entered the competition because it, it, I know it lightened the lives of more people than me just looking at that amazing explosion of cre creativity. Yeah. And you lit up so many lives there. All the winners were so happy, so well done. So now over to J.K. Rowling to read that winning chapter. Chapter One, King Fred the Fearless. Once upon a time, there was a tiny country called Cornucopia, which had been ruled for centuries by a long line of fair-haired kings. The king at the time of which I write was called King Fred the Fearless. He denounced the fearless bit himself on the morning of his coronation, partly because it sounded nice with Fred, but also because he'd once managed to catch and kill a wasp all by himself. If you didn't count five footmen and the boot boy, King Fred the Fearless came to the throne on a huge wave of popularity. He had lovely yellow curls, fine sweeping moustaches, and looked magnificent in the tight breeches, velvet doublets, and ruffled shirts that rich men wore at the time. Fred was said to be generous, smiled and waved whenever anyone caught sight of him, and looked awfully handsome in the portraits that were distributed throughout the kingdom to be hung in town halls. The people of Cornucopia were most happy with their new king, and many thought he'd end up being even better at the job than his father, Richard the Righteous, whose teeth, though nobody had liked to mention it at the time, were rather crooked. King Fred was secretly relieved to find out how easy it was to rule Cornucopia. In fact, the country seemed to run itself. Nearly everybody had lots of food, the merchants made pots of gold, and Fred's advisers took care of any little problem that arose. All that was left for Fred to do was beam at his subjects whenever he went out in his carriage and go hunting five times a week with his two best friends, Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flapoon. 
Spittleworth and Flapoon had large estates of their own in the country, but they found it much cheaper and more amusing to live at the palace with the king, eating his food, hunting his stags, and making sure that the king didn't get too fond of any of the beautiful ladies at court. They had no wish to see Fred married, because a queen might spoil all their fun. For a time, Fred had seemed to rather like Lady Aslanda, who was as dark and beautiful as Fred was fair and handsome. But Spittleworth had persuaded Fred that she was far too serious and bookish for the country to love her as queen. Fred didn't know that Lord Spittleworth had a grudge against Lady Aslanda. He'd once asked her to marry him, but she'd turned him down. Lord Spittleworth was very thin, cunning and clever. His friend Flapoon was ruddy-faced, and so enormous that it required six men to heave him onto his massive chestnut horse. Though not as clever as Spittleworth, Flapoon was still far sharper than the king. Both lords were expert at flattery, and pretending to be astonished by how good Fred was at everything from riding to tiddlywinks. If Spittleworth had a particular talent, it was persuading the king to do things that suited Spittleworth. And if Flapoon had a gift, it was for convincing the king that nobody on earth was as loyal to the king as his two best friends. Fred thought Spittleworth and Flapoon were jolly good chaps. They urged him to hold fancy parties, elaborate picnics and sumptuous banquets, because Cornucopia was famous, far beyond its borders, for its food. Each of its cities was known for a different kind, and each was the very best kind in the world. The capital of Cornucopia, Shuville, lay in the south of the country and was surrounded by acres of orchards, fields of shimmering golden wheat and emerald green grass on which pure white dairy cows grazed. The cream, flour and fruit produced by the farmers here was then given to the exceptional bakers of Shuville who made pastries. Think, if you please, of the most delicious cake or biscuit you have ever tasted. Well, let me tell you, they'd have been downright ashamed to serve that in Shuville. Unless a grown man's eyes filled with tears of pleasure as he bit into a Shuville pastry, it was deemed a failure and never made again. The bakery windows of Shuville were piled high with delicacies such as maiden's dreams, fairies' cradles, and most famous of all, hopes of heaven which were so exquisitely, painfully delicious that they were saved for special occasions and everybody cried for joy as they ate them. King Porfirio of neighbouring Pluritania had already sent King Fred a letter, offering him the choice of any of his daughter's hands in marriage in exchange for a lifetime supply of hopes of heaven. But Spittleworth had advised Fred to laugh in the Pluritanian ambassador's face. His daughters are nowhere near pretty enough to exchange for hopes of heaven, sire, said Spittleworth. To the north of Shuville lay more green fields and clear sparkling rivers, where jet black cows and happy pink pigs were raised. These in turn served the twin cities of Kurdsburg and Baronstown, which were separated from each other by an arching stone bridge over the main river of Cornucopia, the Flumer, where brightly coloured barges bore goods from one end of the kingdom to another. Kurdsburg was famous for its cheeses, huge white wheels, dense orange cannonballs, big crumbly blue veined barrels and little baby cream cheeses smoother than velvet. Baronstown was celebrated for its smoked and honey roasted hams, its sides of bacon, its spicy sausages, its melting beefsteaks and its venison pies. The savoury fumes rising from the chimneys of the red brick Baronstown stoves mingled with the odorous tang wafting from the doorways of the Kurdsburg cheesemongers, and for 40 miles all around, it was impossible not to salivate, breathing in the delicious air. A few hours north of Kurdsburg and Baronstown, you came upon acres of vineyards bearing grapes as large as eggs, each of them ripe and sweet and juicy. Journey onwards for the rest of the day, and you reached the granite city of Jeroboam, famous for its wines. They said of the Jeroboam air that you could get tipsy simply walking its streets. 
the best vintages changed hands for thousands upon thousands of gold coins, and the Jeroboam wine merchants were some of the richest men in the kingdom. But a little north of Jeroboam, a strange thing happened. It was as though the magically rich land of Cornucopia had exhausted itself by producing the best grass, the best fruit, and the best wheat in the world. Right at the northern tip came the place known as the marshlands, and the only things that grew there were some tasteless, rubbery mushrooms and thin, dry grass, only good enough to feed a few mangy sheep. The marshlanders who tended the sheep didn't have the sleek, well-rounded, well-dressed appearance of the citizens of Jeroboam, Baronstown, Kurdsburg or Shuville. They were gaunt and ragged. Their poorly nourished sheep never fetched very good prices, either in Cornucopia or abroad, so very few marshlanders ever got to taste the delights of Cornucopian wine, cheese, beef or pastries. The most common dish in the marshlands was a greasy mutton broth made of those sheep who were too old to sell. The rest of Cornucopia found the marshlanders an odd bunch, surly, dirty and ill-tempered. They had rough voices, which the other cornucopians imitated, making them sound like hoarse old sheep. Jokes were made about their manners and their simplicity. As far as the rest of cornucopia was concerned, the only memorable thing that had ever come out of the marshlands was the legend of the Ichabog.